Good evening. Uh, well, I'd like to invite you tonight uh, to turn to the book of Matthew chapter 28. Uh, and uh, I thought I would have a bit of a change of uh, background scenery. So I'm in a different room at my house, uh, being able to uh, record the sermon for tonight. And um, we're going to uh, be talking about Easter as a time uh, for discernment, time for discernment. So in the book of Matthew, chapter 28, I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 15. It says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulchre. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, that is the guard, who were there to protect the body from being stolen, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen as he said. Come, see the place uh, Come, see the place where the Lord lay and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And they departed quickly from the sepulcher with fear and great joy and did run to bring his disciples word. And as they went to tell his disciples, behold, Jesus met them saying, All hail. And they came and held him by the feet and worshipped him. Then said Jesus unto them, Be not afraid. Go, tell my brethren that they go into Galilee, and there shall they see me. Now, when they were going, behold, some of the watch, that is the guards, who were sent originally to guard the, the tomb, uh, because there was a rumour that, uh, that he was going to rise again uh, from the dead, and they thought uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, that uh, there was going to be some conspiracy afoot uh, to steal his body. It says that, uh, behold, some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priests all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and a taking council, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we will persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. That is the time uh, that Matthew wrote this gospel um, account for us. Uh, of course, there are still people today who uh, might uh, still uh, hold to this idea that the body was stolen uh, by uh, the disciples at that early time. Uh, now, of course, um, uh, that, that first Sunday after the resurrection of Christ was a time to exercise discernment. When Jesus rose from the dead, a story went around uh, to cover up what had actually taken place, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, and this story was that uh, while the soldiers were asleep, the disciples uh, snuck in into the, the tomb and took away his body. Uh, and uh, that's why there's no, uh, that's why there was an empty tomb while the body was missing. Uh, whereas, in fact, we know that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ had, in fact, risen from the dead and had appeared to many people, even as, as many as 500 people at one time. Uh, and uh, yet, this story was circulating. Uh, about the fact that, uh, or about the idea that uh, the disciples had come and, st and stolen the body while the guards uh, were asleep. Now, of course, that's a problem in itself because to be a guard in those days uh, didn't just mean that you lost your job if you fell asleep. It meant that you were executed. Uh, and so uh, uh, that's no small thing. You know, I think you'd want to stay awake rather than risk having to be executed. But in any case, we live in a, a day and age uh, where discernment is much needed. Uh, right now, uh, there are many different stories and theories 
about what is really going on in relation to the COVID-19 virus and all sorts of conspiracy ideas are circulating. I've heard some interesting ones recently, uh, which I won't go too much into, but uh, just uh, completely different idea. They're, they're denying that there is any form of virus. Uh, they're saying that it's rather that it's it's got to do with mobile phones and uh, with uh, the radiation from 5G and all that sort of thing. And, uh, and so that's their explanation. And uh, they're saying that um, these things are getting ready, of course, to, uh, for the Antichrist to take over and all that sort of thing. Um, now, not only do we need to be careful about uh, theories like that, who supposedly come from experts or people in the know, but uh, we need to be careful about what we accept concerning things to do with Easter. Now, of course, I'm not talking about what the Bible teaches us. I'm not, tell uh, not speaking about the fact of the resurrection. Uh, one of the greatest events of, of human history is the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what I'm talking about are stories that arise around the time of Easter or concerning the time of Easter, uh, which some pick up, uh, even good men, good women, uh, pick up those stories and they run with them as if they're gospel truth, as if they're uh, taken from the word of God. And, uh, uh, and we need to be careful about that. Many years ago, I'll give, just give you an example. Many years ago, there was a, uh, a book written in 1853, uh, which was originally written to expose the practices uh, and the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. And it was written uh, by a free Presbyterian minister by the name of Alexander Hislop. Here is not the book, uh, but here is a, uh, a picture that I uh, just printed off uh, of the cover of that book. Uh, and there it is, the, the two Babylons, uh, subtitled The Papal Worship Proved to be the Worship of Nimrod and His Wife. Uh, and the book, the book became very uh, popular, uh, particularly amongst Protestants, of course, and not so much amongst Catholics. Uh, but uh, especially amongst fundamentalists, those who believe the, the word of God. And then there are a number of other groups uh, that are sort of spurious groups or even cults such as the Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah's Witnesses who also picked up on the information that was found in this famous book, The Two Babylons. And they used that to try and convince their followers uh, that uh, the Roman Catholic Church was a corrupt church, that it was based in paganism, uh, and uh, and uh, that they uh, that really it supported the idea that uh, what they were saying uh, was true. Now, of course, I want to just say at this point, I'm not in any way saying that uh, I agree with the teachings or the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. There's many errors that we we see there as as uh, uh, we study the scriptures. But um, just in relation to this book, it became very popular. Uh, in the Christian world. And in 1966, another book was written, not quite as uh, large as uh, the other book. The other books are really about something like this. Uh, this little book uh, is just a small book, and so it's very easy to read, called Babylon Mystery Religion. That's written by Ralph Woodrow of the Ralph Woodrow Evangelistic Association. Uh, this was written in 1966, and it takes, uh, it's not all taken from uh, Hislop's Two Babylons, but there's a lot of information uh, which is taken from his book, Two Babylons, and then is summarized for us in this book. And of course, that's a lot uh, thinner book uh, than the other one, which was, was about this thick. Uh, and uh, uh, so it too became very popular. The books claimed that the religion of ancient Babylon, under the leadership of Nimrod and his wife Semiramis, uh, was later disguised with Christian-sounding names uh, and became the doctrines and practices of the Roman Catholic Church, and thus the idea of two Babylons, one ancient, one modern. Uh, and proof for this was sought by citing numerous similarities in paganism, uh, particularly in uh, the ancient times of Babylon, but also uh, he... He uh, sort of gave the idea that uh, various different cultures uh, adopted those uh, similar practices, uh, even though they had different names and things. 
Uh, and so uh, eventually it filtered down to the Roman Catholic Church. So uh, some of the practices of the Roman Catholic Church that um, uh, found in uh, ancient Babylon included uh, these. Uh, the Babylonians went to a confessional and they confessed their sins to priests who wore black clerical garments. Does that sound familiar? Uh, their king, Nimrod, was born on what day do you think it was? December 25th. Uh, round decorations on fir trees, hung on fir trees, uh, were uh, to celebrate uh, and to honour him as the sun god, along with uh, these wafers that they would uh, put into their mouths uh, in honour of him as a form of worship. Uh, again, the round wafers, similar to communion wafers in the, in the Mass. Uh, sun worshippers went to their temples on a weekly basis on Sunday, Sunday, the day of the sun, to worship the sun god. Uh, Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, uh, claimed to be the virgin queen of heaven and was the mo mother of a baby by the name of Tammuz. Tammuz was later killed by a wild boar when he was 40 years old. And so a special period of time, uh, similar to Lent, our modern day Lent, 40 days, uh, was set aside to honour his death. And then the Babylonians uh, wept for him on a Friday, uh, similar to Good Friday, uh, and they worshipped a cross, uh, which was the initial of the, uh, the, the babe or the, the young man, at least, uh, uh, whose name was Tamar. So the, the initial was a T. Uh, and so the books also teach that things like candles, the letters IHS, which is found on the, the communion wafers, uh, the fish symbol, the halos that you find in various different uh, Greek Orthodox uh, diagrams and Roman Catholic uh, images and things, church steeples, the, all these things were of pagan origin. The Pope, it, it claims, wears a mitre or a, a crown upon his head. And on the inside, uh, in Roman numerals, is the number 666. Uh, and then, of course, the papal mitre was, uh, the, the shape of it was copied from the fish head of Dagon, again, from uh, pagan, uh, pagan culture and pagan, pagan religion. Now, uh, you may be familiar with that. You may have seen some even more recent publications, such as some of the Chick publications, uh, which, again, take from the two Babylons or Mystery Babylon religion, and then they uh, illustrate it for us and uh, show us some of these things. However, the author of Babylon Mystery Religion, Ralph Woodrow, was challenged one day to do some deeper research into the historical veracity or truthfulness of the claims of this book, The Two Babylons, and of course his own book as well. And he discovered that all these claims about religion in Babylon were actually all unsubstantiated in history. That's uh, quite an amazing thing. Nimrod and Semiramis, for example, supposedly uh, uh, upon whom the whole book uh, is based uh, they're supposedly, they're depicted in his book as being husband and wife. Well, in actual fact, uh, though they are uh, two historical fi uh, picture, two historical figures, rather, uh, these two people lived centuries apart and, of course, uh, would not have been able to be uh, husband and wife. The author, Ralph Woodrow, wrote, it's amazing how unsubstantiated teachings like these circulate and are believed. One can go to any library, check any history book about ancient Babylon. Not, none of these things will be found. They are not historically accurate, but are based on arbitrary piecing together of bits and pieces of mythology. Hislop, for example, taught that mythological persons like Adonis, uh, Apollo, Bacchus, Cupid, Dagon, Hercules, Janus, Mars, Mithra, Moloch, Orion, Osiris, Pluto, Saturn, Vulcan, and Zoroaster, and many more, were all, in fact, Nimrod. He then formed his own history of Nimrod based upon that study, and he did the same thing with Nimrod's wife. 
Since discovering the errors that uh, Ralph Woodrow's book was propagating, uh, he's since taken his book off the market. And so you can search for it on the internet, uh, find a lot of positive things about the book. But if you actually go to his website, you'll see that he's taken it off and replaced it uh, with a book which goes through and uh, really refutes uh, the, the book To Babylons by Hislop uh, and gives uh, an explanation why he took his book uh, off the market. He wrote, no church ever included a steeple or tower on their house of worship to copy the Tower of Babel. No Christian who puts a bumper sticker with a fish symbol on the back of his car has ever done so to honour the fish god uh, Dagon. No congregation has ever put a cross on a church building for the purpose of honouring Tammuz. No Christian has ever gone to an Easter sunrise service to worship Baal. No Christian has ever worshipped a Christmas tree as an idol. Uh, and uh, so uh, claims that imply that all these things started in Babylon, he said, are not only divisive and fruitless, but they are actually untrue. And it's because of books like Hislops and the earlier uh, book of Woodrow's uh, that he's now taken off the market and the information that is filtered down into some of the chip, chick publications, that many conservative Christians are opposed now to Easter and likewise Christmas time. Uh, they're uh, they're opposed to, to the, the celebration of such a time as this uh, as a legitimate time to celebrate the resurrection of Christ. But uh, really, when you look at uh, the, uh, the source of information here, it's really an unjustified decision. How many of us have heard that the word Easter, for example, is in itself a pagan uh, term or a pagan concept, and it comes from either the goddess Ishtar, or it has its origin with a goddess of the Anglo-Saxons named uh, Ostra. Ostra, the goddess of the dawn, supposedly worshipped in the spring by pagans in Northern Europe and the British Isles. And yet the scholar who suggested that uh, Ostra, the historian who suggested that Ostra uh, was the origin of Easter, actually admitted that he speculated that the word Easter probably came from an early pagan goddess by that name. And yet there's not, when you look in the history books, uh, there's not a single reference to her from Anglo-Saxon chronicles of history. Uh, any of the other writings uh, that we have from, from the period or from inscriptions, there is no depiction, there is no amulets, there is no evidence whatsoever from history or archaeology to back it up. And so uh, we have to conclude, as far as history is concerned, that such a goddess uh, never even existed. Uh, Ishtar, on the other hand, was an Akkadian goddess. Uh, she was never depicted as a mother or a wife, for that matter. Uh, and linguistically, there's no, rela no relationship between the English word Easter and the Akkadian word Ishtar. Uh, even though the two words Easter and Ishtar sound similar in English, there is no linguistic connection. Uh, actually, Easter is an English word that derives from German. It's interesting in all the language, various different European languages, uh, they, uh, when they're referring to this Easter time, as we call it, uh, they use a var variant of the Latin word Pascha. Uh, referring to the Passover or to what we refer to in English as the Paschal Lamb, the Lamb of the Passover. And so they name this holiday, uh, this special holiday, they, they name it uh, with a name similar to Pascha, the Latin Pascha. So in Spanish, now forgive me if I say this wrong, I know that there's a lot of you who uh, speak um, Spanish, uh, and so I'm probably going to mispronounce this, but uh, the, the name in Spanish for Easter is Pascua de Resurrection. Uh, in Italian, it is Pascua. In French, it is Pach. Uh, in Russian, it is Pascha. In Dutch, it is Pas. In Swedish, it is Posk. And in Greek, it is Pascha. So each of those other countries uh, or those other languages, they uh, use the term to refer to the time 
of Passover. Uh, whereas uh, English is different. We, uh, we refer to the time as Easter, typically. So the, the German equivalent uh, from which we get our word Easter is the word Oster, uh, which means literally the rising, the rising. And in reference, uh, it's often used in reference to the rising of the sun. Uh, and of course, uh, we get our word East from the word. Uh, and uh, East is uh, the, where the rising of the sun takes place. Uh, Oster in German comes from an old Teutonic word, which means resurrection. And of course, uh, when it comes to the, the rising of the sun each morning, it's as if uh, uh, the sun has uh, died and then uh, in the west at night, and then in the morning and the dawn, the sun resurrects and rises uh, from its place. And so uh, that idea of resurrection is, is, uh, is uh, referred to the time when the Lord Jesus arose from the dead. In fact, in Acts chapter 12 and verse 4, it says, And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. After the time, the Greek word is referring to the Passover, or uh, it is also referring to the time that we now know as Easter, the time of the resurrection, the resurrection. The remembrance, uh, the uh, annual remembrance of the time of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we speak of Easter Sunday, we mean Resurrection Sunday. Uh, we're not referring to the pagan, the celebration of pag pagan springtime fertility rites or anything like that. Uh, when we when we talk about Easter, we're referring to Christ. We're not referring to anything pagan. However, if the name we now use to refer to Christ's resurrection was in fact connected to a goddess some 1400 years ago. If they found in uh, some unearthed part of history uh, some reference to, uh, you know, Ostra, uh, the, uh, the Anglo-Saxon goddess, uh, if they did find that that was the case, it still doesn't bear a connection today to the word Easter, a historical one. You see, words change meaning over time. Uh, an analogy might be drawn to our current calendar system where we use the term Sunday to refer to the day on which Christ rose from the dead. We worship the Lord. We have church on a Sunday. Uh, and yet in having it on a Sunday, there's no hint there that uh, we come to worship the Son, as in S-U-N. We come to worship the Son of Righteousness, with healing in his wings, as uh, the book of Malachi refers to the Lord Jesus Christ, but we don't worship the, the yellow orb in the sky, the, uh, the, the sun. Uh, we refer to the month of July with no connotation uh, of the emperor for whom the month it was originally named, which is Julius Caesar. We don't refrain from using words such as janitor, uh, even though it comes from Janus, the Roman god of doors and gates. We don't refrain from using the word cereal at breakfast time, uh, even though it comes from Ceres, the goddess of grains. We don't refrain from using the word panic, uh, even though it comes from the god Pan, who went about scaring people, uh, according to mythology. Uh, it doesn't, uh, we don't refrain from calling a book of maps an atlas, even though it comes from Atlas, who was in mythology condemned to support or hold up the earth uh, for eternity. You've probably seen uh, pictures of uh, his statue of the man holding up the globe, as it were. Uh, we don't refrain from using the word money, though it's said to come from Juno Moneta, a goddess to, whom, uh, to, to whose temple a Roman mint was attached. Uh, we don't refrain from using the word cloth, even though clotho, a daughter of Jupiter and Themis was the goddess that spun the thread of life. We do not refrain from using the word flower, even though flora was originally the goddess of flowers. We do not refrain from using the word ocean, even though Oceanus, son of Uranus, was the god of the sea. Uh, many ordinary terms that we use in day-to-day -day life are derived from pagan origins, and they don't retain those meanings anymore. 
meanings change, uh, words change in the course of time. And so it doesn't matter for us as Christians uh, whether we use those words or not. Uh, there's nothing inherently wrong in using those terms. Uh, there's nothing inherently evil uh, with practicing certain traditions of Easter time that have come to us over the years, down through the centuries, uh, such as decorating an egg as a part of celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ, or giving chocolate Easter eggs, uh, the symbol of new life, or uh, giving a chocolate Easter bunny the symbol of spreading the gospel rapidly, the principle of multiplication, as it were. In fact, uh, seeing coloured eggs, uh, and this is an interesting point, the, the, the seeing coloured eggs or chocolate bunnies as evil is actually akin to a pagan worldview where objects have inherent secret meanings. The word occult means hidden or secret. There's a there's a secret knowledge. The Gnostics used to brag about their secret knowledge. And this, all this sort of thing uh, where we, we, uh, we, we give uh, these common uh, ordinary practices associated with a Christian holiday, we give them pagan and, and, uh, um, and wicked meanings, uh, really is, uh, is, is like a pagan worldview. Uh, where they would have these inherent secret meanings or uh, they uh, uh, would believe that these sorts of things were animated by evil spirits. Ironically, those who label Easter eggs and bunnies as evil are actually reacting in a pagan manner. It's not a Christian thing to do that. Uh, Paul said in 1 Timothy chapter 4, and I'll just get my Bible here, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse uh, seven. Let's uh, quickly turn there. First Timothy chapter four. Hopefully, I haven't shell shocked too many of you as you've listened to this message. Uh, but uh, it says here in uh, First Timothy chapter four and verse seven, it says, "But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness." Uh, so the expression here, old wives' fables, it refers to a common picture in Paul's time of the tendency to be too ready to believe that something is real or true uh, that you've heard, that you've read, uh, because you don't have the maturity or the discipline to go and do what is necessary to verify whether or not that thing is true or not. Uh, the word fables here is from the Greek word muthos, uh, from which we get our English word myth or myths. Uh, and so there are many myths uh, that are surrounding this time of Easter, which can rob us of our freedom in Christ and can rob us of, of our focus uh, to be living a godly life. The Christian life is not about uh, how many mysterious things or secret things or hidden things you might know about that the rest of the world doesn't know uh, and that somehow you've got some sort of spiritual advantage over them. Uh, that's more like Gnosticism. Uh, rather, the Christian life is, is, uh, is as, as the Bible says in the book of Romans, it's righteousness, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. Uh, and it's practicing godliness as allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to live in and through us. Uh, and so these, uh, these things, which perhaps uh, maybe you've uh, been swayed by some of these things, maybe you've been uh, persuaded by some of these ideas that have been printed by various different Christian organizations that have had conservative Christian uh, support and approval, uh, maybe that's influenced your thinking. I want to ask you tonight to, uh, to think through those things. The Bible says, uh, and of course you can disagree with what I've said tonight, and that's fine, but the Bible says to prove all things. Prove all things. Test whether or not those things are so. And I think if you do, uh, you'll find that there's very little evidence uh, that those books uh, are really uh, have uh, any substantiation to what they're saying, as much as we might want them to say those things uh, because of the errors of, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we can't go by that. We can't go by myths uh, and up and holding on to myths. 
rather we should go to the Word of God and uh, say, Thus saith the Lord, this is what the Bible says, uh, and make that our stay, make that our strength, make that uh, our uh, what we stand upon rather than upon these spurious uh, sources of information, which um, uh, at best just interesting, uh, but at worst uh, are uh, robbing us of our joy, robbing us of uh, our Christian freedom uh, in Christ. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you, Lord, for this study tonight. Uh, pray, help us, Lord, in uh, these times. It's so easy to fall prey to a conspiracy that we hear, uh, particularly, Lord, if that conspiracy is spurned by someone who seems to be an expert in their field, uh, someone who uh, seems to have knowledge that we've not heard before and uh, it seems to be legitimate, seems to fit the picture. Uh, yet, Lord, help us to be truly discerning, to judge these things, not to be a gullible people, but to be a discerning people. And, Lord, I ask, Father, that uh, you bless our time of prayer tonight. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, uh, I have a couple of uh, prayer letters that I want to read to you uh, before we pray. First of all, there's a report uh, from Pastor Robert Bax about uh, missionary Jeremy Pinero. Um, and uh, he says, I've just been speaking with uh, missionary Jeremy Pinero following the destruction of Cyclone Harold on the island of Santo Vanuatu. The cyclone made a direct hit on the island where Jeremy and Liz live and they have suffered extensive property damage to their own home, campsite, and church property. They are all safe, and nobody in their family has been injured, for which we're thankful to the Lord for. Uh, he sent a number of photos, which I won't show you just now. They're just basically a destruction of buildings and things uh, in Luganville. Uh, he says, whilst all other buildings were destroyed, uh, the Lord protected the church building, which will now possibly be used for emergency housing. There will be a mammoth recovery effort required and the most needed assistance we can offer the Paneros uh, is finances to enable them to rebuild. Obviously, there is never a good time for a natural disaster, but we also know that the world pandemic of coronavirus COVID-19, that many people are already financially stretched and in need of assistance. We also know our God is in control and there is no panic in heaven. We rest in this confidence that our God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus, Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. If your church is willing and able to assist with the rebuilding and recovery costs, any offering to assist the Paneros with the many projects would be greatly appreciated. All offerings can be sent via direct deposit to Lighthouse Baptist Church, Vanuatu Ministry Account, uh, the BSB is 064709 and the account is uh, 10835396. So that's BSB uh, 064709, account number 10835396. It says as, as more information comes in from Jeremy, we will keep you posted. Please be in prayer for the Paneros as they seek to minister to the church families and people in the community, both in town and up in the jungle. Uh, and so uh, please be praying for the Paneros uh, over there in Vanuatu. And if uh, you are able to uh, to send some support, some support to help them as they seek to rebuild uh, and to help other families there, then uh, please avail you yourself of that. Uh, we also have a prayer letter from the Portillo uh, family. Uh, there, there they are there. Uh, and it just says, your missionaries in Nicaragua. Dear pastors and praying friends, firstly, thank you for praying for us over the past few weeks. Uh, God has been faithful and we have seen spiritual victories in the lives of our church. Pastored uh, a couple through a rough season in their marriage and seen again many souls saved. We have started smaller cell groups during the week and monthly men's, ladies, and teens meetings. We have also had the joy of seeing our faithful members continuing to be soul winners and discipling others. Perhaps you remember Fran, the police officer, 
the first man we led to Christ here in Lyon as he was hitchhiking. Uh, he and Doris, his wife, have been running one of our routes for church, a bus route that is. Angela has been training Doris to teach a children's class and she just started as the main teacher last month. Their sincere love for the Lord has been rubbing off on their neighbours and last year they brought a family to church. The couple, Fabio and Jacqueline, with their two sons, received Christ as Saviour early last year. The Lord began his work in their hearts and then in March of this year they were married. Uh, two days later, Sunday morning, they followed the Lord in believers' baptism. We're excited to see how the Lord will keep growing them in their leadership skills. They help in Sunday school, assist with church setup, have completed discipleship, and are continually looking for ways to serve the Lord. Jacqueline has been Angela's soul winning partner and this month graduated to being the one to talk at the doors. Jacqueline has since led four souls to Christ. Looking at the chain of events, we're amazed at the many souls saved and lives changed by the gospel as a result of one man's boldness in bringing his friend to Jesus. On the back of the page, it says, We started Awana in February with around uh, 90 children. We had a great orientation session, half of them with perfect attendance and working hard at their Bible memory, and the others not too far behind. God has been faithful to provide for the needs of this ministry and we have seen the Lord work in their hearts through salvation and a growing hunger for the word of God. Please pray the Lord would give us wisdom. We have seen in the news the devastating effects of the COVID-19 all around the world. Please pray for Nicaragua. 50% of our country would be considered high risk due to malnutrition, diabetes, hypertension, age or obesity. However, very few steps have been made for prevention of this disease and we're concerned at how fast this could spread. After much prayer and seeking God's will, we have cancelled church for the month of April. Private schools have closed. Most people are wearing masks wherever they travel in town and people who can afford it have been stocking up on groceries. Yesterday, we prepared 50 sacks of supplies for some of the families in our church to ease their financial burden. Many have lost their jobs, so they have been struggling, really struggling to make ends meet and buy food. Along with these food packages, we have been delivering devotionals with daily uh, homework to complete. Probably 10% of our church has a smartphone in their home, and even less would have access to the internet. So we wouldn't be able to do the YouTube or Facebook live streaming as many churches are doing. Please pray with us that God will allow us to keep influencing our city for Christ. Pray that he would protect us, keep our hearts warm as a church, and we would continue to see much fruit. Please pray that God would give us insight as to what is occurring in our country with the virus, and God would give us wisdom to have a right balance between zeal and prudence. That's good. That's, uh, that's wise. We love you and thank you for your prayers and support. We have received several emails asking about our support level this last month. And we can tell you God has been faithful to provide all we need. We are praying for you. God bless Ricardo and Angela Portillo uh, and the babies, Ricardo 6, Sophia 4, Rebecca 2 and Anna 1. Okay, so there's some things uh, to pray about and I'll send out the, uh, the text uh, as well uh, with uh, different prayer requests uh, for tonight. Uh, so God bless and uh, we'll, uh, uh, we look forward to our special Good Friday service. Uh, we'll try to have some singing uh, for Good Friday and also for a Sunday and I've got a plan uh, for how we might be able to start uh, restart Sunday school again soon. So we thank you uh, for praying and uh, ask that uh, you'd uh, uh, just continue to be faithful, looking to the Lord at this diff difficult time. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>